but the the end goal it seems to me ought to be that if you are entitled to call yourself a barrister you are someone who's completed all of the training in order to be able to have that professional title hello everyone and welcome to the student lawyer podcast series whether you're at school sixth form university thinking about a career in law or exploring law careers you're in the right place We are the one-stop shop for student lawyers. If you'd like to join The Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com. This podcast is brought to you by Feed Ignite. Welcome to The Student Lawyer podcast series. My name is Camilla and I'm an LPC student and future trainee solicitor. Today I'm joined by Mr. Derek Sweeting QC, Chairman of the Bar Council. Derek and I will be discussing the reforms that Derek is proposing in relation to the process of qualification as a barrister. So without further ado, welcome to the Student Lawyer Podcast, Derek. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Okay, as an icebreaker, would you mind giving the listeners an overview of your practice and career history? Yes, I was called to the bar in 1983. I didn't have a a legal background, but I'd done a a law degree at university. I I started as a a circuiteer, really, which means being on circuit. Although my chambers have always been in London, I've always been at the same chambers. My circuit really had uh, practices which were based on the Midlands and Oxford Circuit as it then was. So I spent most of my early years going around the Midlands, Birmingham, Nottingham, all the way across to Grimsby and Lincoln and so on, doing a mix of common law, which was mostly crime with some county court work. So for about 15 years or so, I did mostly crime. I ended up doing a lot of work for the Serious Fraud Office and prosecuting fraud. I then stopped doing crime for various reasons, and I started doing a lot more commercial and construction work. And that's what I was doing as I took Silk, which was 2001. And I carried on doing that for a while. And then I started doing a lot of government work. So in the last decade or so, I've been doing quite a lot for the government around Iraq and a bit about Afghanistan. So the claims which were brought against the UK. And that was defence work, defending the UK effectively, a whole series of cases, some of them which went to the Supreme Court. And as well as doing that, the other thing I've done a lot of is clinical negligence work, mostly in relation to maximum severity injuries resulting from birth, so children who got cerebral palsy as a result of hypoxia at birth and so on. So that's quite a contrast with the the government work. But that's, in a nutshell, I suppose, what I've done across my legal career. I also sit as a recorder in the criminal courts and the county court. And I'm also a deputy high court judge. So I sit in the high court as well from time to time. Fantastic. Well, that sounds like a really varied background. Um, So, yeah, very interesting. Um, It's also interesting that you also mentioned that you don't have legal background as well. That's... uh... Well, in the sense of not having a family, really, that came from the law. It's one of the things people often ask. I mean, do you need to have some sort of intro? Is it is it a bit of a closed shop? So I think it's always quite important to say that that isn't the case. Certainly isn't the case now. It wasn't even the case when I started. It was possible to to do it, even though you know you didn't necessarily know your way around in the way that uh, some people did if they got a bit more infi- inside information. But I went to school in in Essex. The school I left was a, a comprehensive school, so it uh, it wasn't a case of having to have a certain sort of trajectory in order to get to the bar in the first place. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really important to mention that. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for sharing. Um, okay, so I'd like to move on now to um, uh, the discussion about the the reforms that that you've uh, been talking about um, recently in, in various newspapers. And um, I wondered if we could maybe start at the beginning. And for the listeners who might not be familiar with the current qualification process for barristers, could you please explain what the current process is? 
Yes. Yeah, so uh, aspiring barristers really take um, uh, two different routes to start with. You either have a law degree or you have a non-law degree and then you take the conversion course. And that's to get you up to of having done all the core subjects that you have to have completed and would have done if you'd done a law degree. So that's the first step, really. You either have a law degree or you do the conversion course following a non-law degree. After that, you join one of the inns of court, which still have their traditional uh, training role. But you have to complete the vocational component, which um, changed from the bar um, practice training course to several approved pathways in September of last year. So students can now take the vocational component in one part, two parts, or integrated into their law degree conversion course. And that depends upon which bar training provider they choose. So it's it's not, not exactly frag- fragmented, but it's flexible now. There are different ways of doing it. But at the end of that, students are then called to the bar by their in once they've completed the vocational component. But that isn't the end of training because there's then the requirement to complete pupillage, which is split into two parts. The first bit, the first six months, which is non-practicing, when essentially you are under the supervision of a pupil supervisor. You're learning the trade, as it were, by following him or her around, doing their work with them, having your the work you do supervised and looked at. And then the second period, which is a practicing period, often referred to as the second six because it's the second six-month period, that's when you get into court on your own account, even though you're still being supervised by a pupil supervisor. So it's a sort of apprenticeship type approach to learning on the job during your pupillage. Great. And and what do you think the main issues are with the current process? Um, Why do you believe that reform is required and what benefit do you think reform would provide to aspiring barristers and the legal profession? Well, I think the the reform which you're referring to really, which I'd proposed, was a pretty modest one in some ways, but it's also quite fundamental in a way. I mean, the from what I've just described, you can see that the training path itself has been subject to updating, modernization to make it more flexible and so on. And of course, it's that's leading through to the point at which you become a practicing barrister. And obviously, once you're a practicing barrister, you'd be in chambers, although other barristers go off and go into employment and work in-house. So that's a, another a route for, for people to take once they've finished their qualifications. But the real point that I was drawing attention to is that although in order to practice at the bar and to be a barrister in the sense in which most people think of people being barristers, you have to complete your pupillage. In fact, you're entitled to call yourself a barrister, to use the term barrister, once you are called to the bar by your inn. And so the effect of that is that, let me put it in sort of stark terms, really, that at the moment we've got um, something in the order of of 17,000 members of the practicing bar, but we've got over 54,000 what are called unregistered barristers. So those are a, a combination of different categories, but it very largely composed of people who haven't in fact gone on to complete the pupillage stage. So we've got that slight disconnect between what I suspect the public thinks of as barristers, those people who are entitled because they've completed their training to represent people in court and to give advice and so on, and a very large body of people who are just entitled to use the term barrister. It does seem to me that's confusing. And it also has some other fairly significant knock-on effects as well. Okay. So what, uh, you know, are there plans for these reforms to take place? Well, I think it's something uh, changing that so that the only people who could call themselves um, a barrister are people who have completed the, the pupillage section is something which has been discussed before. So it's not novel in a sense to, to raise that uh, question. And there are different ways of achieving that. 
But the the end goal, it seems to me, ought to be that if you are entitled to call yourself a barrister, you are someone who's completed all of the training in order to be able to have that professional title. And if you think about it by comparison with the position of solicitors, solicitors go through a long training process, just like barristers. They have to do the legal practice course, but at the end of the legal practice course, they aren't entitled to call themselves solicitor. That is something which only comes after they've done the practical element of their training, which is provided through a training contract in-house at a firm of solicitors generally. And at the end of that, you are admitted to the roles and you are entitled to call yourself a solicitor. And I think you could draw a similar comparison with other professional titles, but we've got an obvious one in the form of the comparison between solicitors and barristers in the way that I've just described. So what I'd proposed and really raised this as a discussion, which has been had before, but it seems to me ought to be resurrected at this stage is deferring the point at which someone could call themselves a barrister until they had completed their practical training just as just as is the position in relation to solicitors so that we wouldn't end up with this very large number of people who have an entitlement to say that they are barristers but in fact haven't gone on to complete uh, pupillage and so i i think probably tend to cause a certain amount of confusion amongst the public about who is and isn't a barrister. And as I hinted, there are there are practical ramifications because everyone who is a barrister is regulated by the Bar Standards Board. But that means, in effect, that we have the 17,000 odd barristers who are in practice, who are actually not a massive regulatory problem in terms of the numbers, and then over 50,000 barristers who many of whom have never practiced and yet are subject to regulation. And that regulation is paid for by the practicing bar, by the 17,000 of us who are actually engaged in in practice as barristers. So there are both financial and, um, and principled reasons, I think, why we might want to say that if you want to call yourself a barrister, you should do what solicitors do and you should complete the entire training period. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I didn't realise that it had that knock-on effect um, in relation to the uh, yeah the administrative burden of, of, of regulation. Um, yeah, I, I wonder why it is that that barristers are entitled to call themselves barristers. Well, I think that the reason is that it's tied to admission to the bar by the inns, which is the historic role of the inns, and that's the point at which once you you are. Um, admitted to the bar by an in you are on the face of it a barrister even though you've then got to go on and complete your pupillage there are some good reasons in fact why you have to be a member of the bar before you can at least complete your pupillage and that's for the simple reason that in order to go into court during your second six in the way that i described earlier in just summarizing how you qualified for the bar, in order to go into court in the second six, you do need to be a barrister. Otherwise, we would be in a a difficult position where you wouldn't actually be entitled to go into court and practice as a a second six pupil barrister. So you do need to be able to say you're a barrister at, um, at that point for various reasons, which are technical and legal, which probably not of too much interest to everyone who's listening. But that's a, a very good reason why. Um, there is also historically another another reason, and that's because the inns were training and they're admitting um, barristers uh, to the bar, and many of those barristers were going back to um, other jurisdictions, Commonwealth and in the past Empire jurisdictions at one stage, and so they were coming to London for training and then going back, having been admitted to the bar and to to one of the inns. I mean, I think we've probably moved on from that being uh, an obstacle to reform, but we've still got the first problem, which is that you do need to be a barrister for the second six. So that the the practical solution to that is probably, it seems to me, and I think to many other people, to defer the point at which you're called to the bar. So instead of being called to the bar at the end of the bar training course, you're called at the end of your first six. And you'll remember I said that the first six is a period when you don't go into court. You're effectively just 
completing the work of others under supervision. And it's not until the second six months that you get work on your own account and you go into court. And so if we deferred the point of being called to the bar to that midpoint, then everyone who was called would be someone who was undertaking a pupillage. And that would answer a lot of the problems, I think, about this this disconnect between when you can call yourself a barrister and whether you've actually done the the practical continuation program um, training, which I think most people expect, goes with the title. That definitely sounds like it would solve a lot of problems. Um, so just out of interest, so now that you've proposed the, re- the reform, what are the next steps b- between you proposing the reform and it actually sort of happening? Well, I think the first step is to have a conversation about it, because although I've presented it, I hope in a way which probably indicates what I think the way forward is and why we should do it. I mean, not everyone thinks like that. And there are opposing arguments, um, a few of which I'm, I've probably touched on or inherent mm-hmm. in what I've said. So I think it's the first thing you know, uh, for all lawyers, I think, is to have a look at the evidence and to see whether or not this is a reform which would address some of the problems that our present um, system throws up, in particular the growing number of people who are barristers and the much smaller number of people who are practising barristers and entitled to to practice as well. So I think that could be addressed in this way, but I think we need to have a conversation about what the solution is. And of course, it's not in, in my gift to do that or to impose the solution because it very much requires a partnership between the Bar Standards Board and the INS. It's primarily a a question for the INS as to when people are called to the bar. But I think it's a good thing to have that discussion. And I suspect that's what we'll be aiming to do. There are various forums in which the Bar Council and the INS of Court and indeed the Bar Standards Board itself all, all meet from time to time to discuss professional issues like this. And this is, I think, one of them that I'd be keen to have a discussion about. And it may be, it'll take a little while. It may be any reform will come after my period as chair of the bar. But that's part of my role, really, to raise issues which can be taken forward by others if they gain some traction. Great. Thank you for explaining that. Um, So what else has the Bar Council been working on that aspiring barristers might be interested in? Are there any other changes that, that are being planned? Well, I think we're, also, we're always very concerned about training and entry to the bar. I mean, there are a number of reasons to be concerned about it and to have ongoing programs, which we do. I mean, one is, is obviously that we want to make sure that the composition of the bar people who are actually practicing as barristers is truly reflective of society, because in the end, that's the, the only way in which ultimately our judiciary will be reflective, although we the judiciary recruit from a number of different sources now, not exclusively barristers. It is important that because many barristers do go on to sit on the bench, that we have a diverse profession and that that's a much better thing for the bar itself. I mean, those who are representing people in court should themselves be representative of wider society. So we have a growing number of outreach programs which are really intended to try and improve diversity and ethnic representation across the bar. I mean, the 10,000 black interns is one that we're engaged in and others as well. So that's an important part of the, the work that we're doing in order to attract a broader range of people to the bar. I mean, just on that point, in fact, um, the gender balance at the point at which people come to the bar is is 50 50 and effectively and it has been for a long time so in a sense at least at the point of entry we no longer have a gender imbalance it was certainly the case when i joined chambers which were predominantly male at that stage that's changed a lot the issues at the bar really in relation to women in particular are about retention in certain sectors at a later point the sort of mid-career point um, and so on so that's also something that we're we're interested in trying to uh, address and help with. And the other point to think about early admission and pupillage is that we're well aware of the financial pressures that people are under. I mean, it's a it's a postgraduate qualification to do the bar training course. And if you've got to do a conversion course as well, that adds to the expense and the time that it takes 
And so financial pressures are very real for a lot of people who are coming to the bar, particularly if we're achieving our objective of recruiting from a much wider um, range and a more diverse range of, of backgrounds. So we're always looking at ways in which we can increase the amount of support that we give to pupils. And of course, this year has been particularly challenging in some ways. For sure. Um, you mentioned the the challenges for this year, and I think that kind of leads me nicely into the next question, which is, um, you know, what impact do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on recruitment of, of pupil barristers and what do you think um, can be done to to help the situation? Well, it's undoubtedly had an impact. I mean, I'd be very surprising, I think, if we if we didn't find that there was some knock-on on effect from the pandemic. So the BSB, so the regulator, the Bar Standards Board, has reported a decrease in the number of pupillages which were registered because they have to be registered with the BSB in 2020. And that decrease was around 35%. So I think that in itself indicates that COVID-19 did have a significant impact on pupillage recruitment. I think the only caveats are that it is likely, I think, that what we were seeing is some deferral of pupillage, because particularly given the nature of the training that's being offered, very much practical training, a lot of it geared necessarily to appearing in court as well as doing advisory work, that if if the bar couldn't offer that hands-on experience of work as a barrister and ultimately the ability to stand up in court in, as part of your second six, and of course all of that was severely curtailed by the impact of lockdowns and the pandemic, if that couldn't be offered, then you can see why pupillage would have been regarded as perhaps not um, the experience everyone was hoping for and in many cases, I think people were deferring and chambers were agreeing to do that. So that has an impact. Having said that, there are plenty of people who've gone through the pupillage process. And I know lots of sets have you know, acted, um, acted as best they could heroically in some cases to try and give people a, an experience of pupillage which uh, matched their expectations and met their training requirements. And actually our recent survey of, of pupils rather indicates that they've been successful most pupils felt supported well supported and well trained even within the ambit of what they were do they were forced to to do and not do as a result of the pandemic but of course everyone pointed out that they'd had less court experience than they might otherwise have have got and if I'm right about that you probably expect some bounce back and I think we are beginning to see that because We've had some 400 pupillages advertised on the Gateway in the most recent recruitment round. The Gateway is not um, is a is a uh, method of advertising run through the Bar Council for pupillage and carrying through the process of recruitment. Not every uh, chambers is signed up to that, but the fact that we've seen an increase in numbers through the Gateway, I think, is the cause for some optimism about the overall position of pupils. And I suppose the last thing to say is that it it hasn't operated evenly across the bar because just as there are some sectors of the bar that have managed to work pretty effectively, um, even with the restrictions imposed on by the pandemic, because it's easier to have remote hearings in some cases than others. And equally, there are bits of the bar, particularly those where it's not really possible to default to remote jury trials and the criminal bar is a good example and they've been affected to a much greater extent so i think we are we do have seen an effect we have seen a bounce back and the bar standards board has built some additional flexibility into this year's timetable so that chambers who couldn't advertise for pupillages earlier in the year can do so if their situation improves and i think we're all hoping that that is going to be the position as we go forward through 2021. That's certainly promising to hear that numbers are picking up a little bit. Um, so that's that's good to know. And I'm sure that our listeners who are thinking of a career at the bar will also um, be pleased to hear that. So we've touched on this a little bit already, um, but I, I wondered if you could just uh, maybe go into a little bit of detail about how the Bar Council is addressing equality, diversity and inclusion at the bar. 
Yes, Camilla. Well, I, I really was making the point earlier that it's um, it's something that's a real concern. It's one of our objectives, uh, a concern in the sense of we we need to be addressing it and making sure we're taking practical steps to try and improve diversity for all the reasons that I touched on earlier. And we are doing just that. I mean, there are a number of programs which are directly addressing issues of diversity, inequality and so on at the bar and and inclusion as well the sense of belonging once you're there so for example we've got something called the accelerator program which is designed to break down barriers that prevent women those with disabilities barristers from ethnic minorities and the lgbt community from progressing and building thriving practices so we do have across the board programs like that and that includes, for example, something called the Leadership Programme, which I suppose rather um, tells you what it is. Um, it's an eight-month um, personal and professional development opportunity for people who we're hoping will be the, the future leaders of the bar. And those on the programme come from a wide range of backgrounds and ethnicities and so on and represent, I think, the modern and diverse bar that we've got at the moment, particularly at the junior end. We're also working hard to produce practice guides for chambers and organisations around topics such as the fair allocation of work, which we know is an important part of making sure that we don't carry on with outdated processes which are uh, you know, don't really lend themselves to equality uh, amongst everyone who's entitled to be in practice at the bar. I suppose the last thing to mention on this is the Talk to Spot tool, which we launched in 2019. And that's to give barristers who are facing discrimination and harassment uh, an anonymous way of recording a complaint or a concern and discussing that with a member of the Bar Council for further guidance. And that's proved a, a valuable tool. I mean, not least recently when the question of um, harassment of women, of course, has become uh, one which is very much um, topical and the way in which allegations of that sort are dealt with by our regulators and disciplinary tribunals is, again, something which has been in the spotlight. So we've we've certainly taken the initiative in trying to make sure that people have an avenue through which they can pursue these things with which they're comfortable and in which they can be confident. Great. That sounds like a great range of initiatives. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. So just moving on to um, the last sort of section of, of the, of the podcast now, um, I wondered if you would, um, if you had any advice for our listeners who are thinking about pursuing a career at the bar uh, yes. Well, I'm always. <laughs> I always think um, the the further away you get from from starting at the bar, in some ways, the less current you are in in terms of offering advice about um, a career at the bar. So, I think my first piece of advice is generally to go and talk to somebody who's a bit closer to events and who's actually gone through the process, because I think it's very easy to look back rather wistfully at uh, a career that you started. At, at a time when things were different for all sorts of reasons, and that's not a that's not a recipe for telling war stories about you know how much harder or easier we had it at a, an earlier stage. I think things are just different as you would expect if you've had a long career because society has changed quite a lot. So what I tend to do when I'm asked for advice is to try and put people in touch with people who are a bit younger and can say some things about the bar and entry to the bar which are relevant to people who are closer to their own their own age so i think that's pretty good advice but i think you can inherent in that is the idea that you should go and seek help and notwithstanding that members of the bar are, as most legal professionals are pretty busy we do have a very strong tradition of being willing to help people who are serious about thinking about a career at the bar and most people, I think, in the in the right context, which is either a mini pupilage maybe, or getting involved in an inn, joining an inn, or asking for help through um, college, uni, that sort of thing. There are lots of people who have contacts at the bar who can put you in touch, and many members of the bar who are perfectly um, willing and delighted to have a chat with someone who's thinking of coming. And I think it's also worth 
uh, making sure that you don't make assumptions about what the bar is like from the outside, particularly if you don't have any any sort of inside track on it really you don't know someone or have a close relative who's at the bar i think i that's as i said right at the outset that's in no sense a difficulty in terms of coming to the bar it certainly shouldn't be but i think what you do need to do is work a bit harder i think at just understanding what the range of different careers and subjects and so on is within the bar and getting an understanding for what a barrister's day looks like in those different areas. There's a very big difference between practicing at the tax bar, for example, and practicing at the criminal bar. So I think understanding what the bar's about is, I think, the first step. And indeed, I think most people who are serious about the bar have generally done that. That's my experience. You know, there's a lot of information out there. You can start with Wikipedia and the various websites of the inns and the law schools and so on. And that'll give you a, a good start. So it's sort of foundational knowledge. I think that's the first thing. And getting in touch with people who can tell you a bit about it. And uh, best of all, people who are a bit closer to entry to the bar itself. Yeah, those are all really good points. Um, I know that there are quite a few mentorship programs for aspiring barristers nowadays. Um, I know that a bit of a plug for our one, the student lawyer has a mentorship um, scheme that is for both solicitors and barristers. So for any of the listeners who do want to um, apply for the mentorship program, we should be running another cycle in August and I'll leave the, um, the details in the description box. Yeah, that's a good example, Camilla. I think there are all sorts of schemes, I think, which people can can take advantage of. You just need to go and find them, don't you? So uh, yeah. you don't need to be backward in coming forward. And when you do find them, when you do find people you can get in touch with or schemes you can get on, then I really would encourage people to come forward, not be shy about exploring the possibility of a career. I mean, the worst that can happen is that you decide it's not for you and that something else would would better fit your talents. But if you're interested, it's definitely something that you should look into because I think most people who embark on a career at the bar and are still there some years later find that really it's one of the most fascinating and interesting careers that you could have within the law. So definitely worth investigating if you've got a bit of interest. So my last question is, If you had a time machine and you could give yourself one piece of advice at the beginning of your career, what would that be? Oh, well, I don't know. I think there's a bit of me that was always a bit hesitant to sort of try and turn back the clock, really, and and say, well, would I have done things differently, which sometimes this question turns into. And I think the answer is no, because... The, uh, the sort of serendipity of um, of a professional life and a career and so on is is part of the joy in a way. You didn't actually know what you were going to end up doing and what you'd be interested in. So things worked out for themselves as you went along. And I, I don't think it's worth thinking about forks in the road or anything like that and so on. But I think if I was thinking about advice, it would be a bit more prosaic, actually. I think it would be something along the lines of sort of take good notes, you know, just just make a good record of things as you go along, people you meet, things you do, um, and even what you spend and that sort of thing. So actually be a bit more present in terms of making sure that you're um, banking, as it were, the information you get. It makes life a lot easier if you can look back and say, oh, yeah, I did that before and so on. So it's a, it's a good it's a good discipline to get into some people do it by journaling or diaries or whatever but actually making sure you record things so you can use them again um, is is actually an enormous time saver when you come to do anything Um, when you come to fill in your accounts at the end of the year when you come to repeat that draft order that you've done before but can't quite remember how it went and so on so being organized enough to do that and having a good habit around it is actually a really good thing to do in practice and it takes a lot of us a long time i think to work out that that's how you should approach it that's excellent advice um even for me making training contract applications um i find it really helpful to kind of keep a note of things that i did on a daily basis because like you said you you look back and and sometimes things can be a bit fuzzy but if, if you keep a good a good record then it does make life easier so yeah i think that's fantastic advice 
<laughs> okay, that is the end of our um, podcast episode. So thank you so much, um, Derek, for being a guest on the show. Uh, it's, it's been great to have you on um, to talk about you know the various uh, topics that we've discussed today. So so thanks again, um, and thank you to all of the listeners as well for tuning in. Thank you, Camilla. I've enjoyed being here. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. To hear more of the Student Lawyers podcast, hit the subscribe button and leave us a star rating and review. If you would like to join the Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com. We'd like to thank Felix Knight for producing this podcast today.